Daniel chapter 6 is a record of these government leaders, set traps, and governors. Now, two of the governors were probably Persians, and one of them was Daniel. And they resented Daniel because Daniel was a Hebrew, a captive. He started out as a slave, and not only is he over those satraps, but King Darius is talking about putting him over the whole thing because he's found him to be faithful. And so these other guys were kind of upset about that. And they came up with this scheme. What the scheme is, is that nobody can pray to anybody but Darius. <laughs> And so, you know, the most common interpretation is that that appeal to his pride. Okay, nobody can go except for, you know, they have to go through you. But really, there could have been another explanation because here they're transitioning between two different kingdoms and all these different nations and they have all these different gods. And, you know, that's one way to consolidate rule, to make sure everybody's on the same page, to make sure everybody's praying the same thing and looking to the same gods. And so there could have been struggles in the kingdom over the different gods. So he could have thought, oh, they're just trying to get everybody on the same page. But when Daniel went up three times a day, which the Jews, Orthodox Jews still do, pray three times a day, going all the way back to their traditions where something that Abraham started the prayer in the morning and Isaac started the prayer at noon <laughs> and uh, Jacob started the prayer in the evening. So they pray three times a day and they have prayers that they pray out of the word of God. It's not just making up you know, whatever you want to pray. They pray in God's prayers and the prayers that God has ordained for them to pray. So Daniel was did that ever since he came to the kingdom. And he did it every day. These guys say that nobody can pray to anybody but Darius. And if they do, if, then they're going to be thrown into the den of lions. And a lion's den was probably pretty rough. And I imagine... From what we see later at the end of the story, that they made it a little rougher by starving those lions. They were ready to eat. And a big lion can eat like over 10 pounds of meat a day. And when they're hungry, they can eat more than that. You don't want to be in a close proximity to a hungry lion. <laughs> they are pretty fierce and they are going to get that meat. So these guys had the scheme all ready to go. Daniel heard about it. And he went straight home, right to his open window that faced Jerusalem. He didn't go home and like close the window so they can't see him or uh, pretend, oh God, you know, just I'm going to skip it a few times and maybe it's going to be all right. He didn't do that. He went, he didn't even miss a lick. It's like he was so confident in who God was that he was going to just, he went and did what he did every day. And he walked right up in that window where everybody could see him and started praying. But the window opened toward Jerusalem. And I think this is kind of interesting. Uh, you know, a lot of people are familiar with this scripture in 2 Chronicles 7.14. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I'll hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. 7.14. Let's turn over to 2 Chronicles 6 at the beginning of that prayer. This is Solomon dedicating the temple, praying these prayers. So 2 Chronicles 6 and we'll start in 36. When they sin against you, when, who's they? Look at verse 34. When your people. 36. When they sin against you, for there is no one who does not sin, and you become angry with them, and deliver them to the enemy, and they take them captive to a land far or near. So where are the Jews right now? In Babylon. And they're captive, right? So this has actually happened. So Daniel, you see all the way through the Bible, is a guy who reads the Bible and lives by it. So this scripture would obviously get his attention because they are in captivity, right? It says when they're held captive, yet when they come to themselves, that means you get back in your right mind in the land where they're carried captive and repent and make supplication to you in the land of their captivity, saying, we have sinned, we have done wrong, we have committed wickedness. And you know, our land of captivity can be anything. It can be sexual immorality, it can be drugs, it can be self, thinking we're important and what we've done is so great. That is a land of captivity. Because now we're separated from the purposes of God and the blessings of God, and, and we can have things that we call blessings, but we don't have that love and that peace and that joy 
And that faithfulness and that gentleness and that self-control, that goodness from being in God's presence, which are the true blessings. And then, of course, eternal life and the fruit in our life, the people in our lives around us being blessed and coming into the kingdom. So it says when we come to ourselves, we need to pray to get out of that captivity, to repent, turn from those things. And when they return to you, 38, with all their heart, and with all their soul in the land of their captivity, where they have been carried captive, and pray toward their land, which you gave to their fathers. It's the promised land. That's the Canaan. That's Israel. So that's why it's such a big deal. Even now, there's a focus on Israel. There's no major trade there. There's no major resources there. Yet all the world's looking there. People are moving in on it, you know, threatening them. Why? Because God gave them this land. And because God has a purpose for this land and Jesus is going to sit on a throne in this land, in this city. It's still going to happen. But when they pray toward their land, which you gave their fathers and the city, which you have chosen and toward the temple, which I have built for your name, then hear from heaven, your dwelling place, their prayer and their supplication and maintain their cause and forgive your people who have sinned against you. See, Daniel just doesn't do things just off the cuff. He's being faithful to the word of God. And regardless of how much they threaten him, they threaten to throw him in the lion's den, kill him, whatever, he's not going to waver. He's seen God faithful. He's seen God come through time and time again, and he knows who he believed. And he knows he's able to deliver him and set him free and bring him into the promises that he promised. What happens when people betray us? What happens when people abuse us? What happens when people abandon us? What happens when we feel like we're betrayed and abandoned by God? What do we do? Because a lot of us just feel like, oh, cast it off. You know, God don't care about me. Those people don't care about me. I'm just going to do whatever I want to do. God, this guy, regardless of the circumstances, regardless of what happened to him, even though he was under threat of death for just doing what's right, you know, these other guys, these other rulers... They're probably skimming money off the top. They're probably, a lot of them were crooked. That's why they didn't want Daniel in there. It wasn't because he was a Hebrew. He used to be a slave. It's because he was honest. They would be threatened by him being over them because he would check the books. See that? So that's the main reason behind this thing is greed. But regardless of what it was, Daniel didn't waver. How old do you think Daniel was about this time when he got thrown in the lion den? 80, 90. He was probably between 80 and 90. That's right. We, a lot of times you see his picture, this young guy in there. But it's a, he, he's been around and he knows, like uh, Jason Crabb was singing, he knows his God is faithful. He's going to deliver him from that lion's death. He don't, and even if he don't, he's not going to serve another God. He's not going to change the routine. He's serving God faithfully. Daniel so, chapter 6 is where we're headed next. The price of faithfulness. The tests of faithfulness. When circumstances, people, even seem to be abandoned by God. Those are the times when God's testing your faithfulness. What are you going to do? Do you cave in and go back to your old ways? Do you figure, well, what's the difference? What's the use? You know, God doesn't really care anyway. Or do you just remain faithful to God? Because it's in the fire, re furnace, that God was revealed to the whole world. It's in this test in the lion's den that God is revealed again to the whole known world. It's through these tests that your faith is proven. Your faith doesn't mean anything if it can't stand up under pressure. Faith is proven by the tests that we're put in. Instead of fear in the lion's den, it's an opportunity for God to show out if we remain faithful. It depends on what we choose. We win or lose by what we choose. Christians never have to be the victims of fate. I was talking to somebody yesterday, one of my friends, and the subject of luck came up. You know, there's no luck for Christians. Luck is totally out of the picture. There was a God of luck, God of fortune in the Old Testament that talks about in Isaiah 55, 65, which they, you know, worship. But everything that happens in the world happens either for a reason or to test us or to cause us to grow deeper into God. There's nothing by accident. That's why you can take a scripture like Romans 8, 28, all things work together for good for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. So all things don't work together for good for everyone. That's true. And if you don't know God, I guess you can attribute things to luck. You're in the wrong place at the wrong time or whatever. 
But if you know God, you know that everything that happens to you, God is going to use that for his purposes for good. If you respond in the right way. It says, for those who love God. What does that mean? If you love God, John uh, 14, 15, you're going to obey him. You're going to do what he said. And that's what opens the door for him to work. The obedience. Obedience. Not everyone who calls me Lord, Lord, Jesus said, when we're all standing before him in heaven, enter the kingdom of heaven. That means just because you say you're a Christian, you don't go in. But those who do the will of my father, because they said many, many, many are going to come before him and said, look, I did this. I helped this. I did the poor. I failed the poor. I preached. I taught Sunday school. I did all this stuff. And he's like, you know, I don't even know you because they were doing that out of their own purposes, out of their own heart. They weren't trusting in God. They weren't finding their direction from the word of God and from him. They were just doing it because they, they liked it or they feel important standing up in front of people talking or it makes them feel good to do stuff for the poor. It does make you feel good to do stuff for the poor, to help the people in prison or sick people. It's, it does make you feel good. But that doesn't get you into the kingdom of heaven. What does? Our trust, our reliance. He said, not everyone who calls me Lord or says they're a Christian enters, but those who do actually do the will of my Father. He said, many will come to me in that day and say all these things they did in his name. And he's going to say, depart from me. I never knew you. So when you look in Nahum 1.7, you see, what does it take for God to know us? It says, God is good, a stronghold in the time of trouble, like he is right here. And he knows those who trust him. That means when you entrust your life to him, you know, like in Proverbs where it says, don't lean in your own understanding in all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your path. You know, when Sam was saying he falls, falls on his knees every day and asks God, you know, what do you want me to do? This is your day. You know, that's the secret. We don't have to be geniuses. We don't have to know every word of this thing. We don't have to have proper doctrine in every area. But when we're trusting God, we open this thing up and believe that God's going to speak to us. He will. We open this thing and believe God's going to provide for us and take care of us. He will. That is how we, God knows us is by entrusting our lives to him. The key is what we've seen all the way through this book is getting off the throne. When we make our decisions, what we're going to do, how we're going to do, this person did that, so I'm going to do this. We make our life, live our lives like that. We talk about this person behind their back, or we say, you know, to make ourselves look better and make them look. We are living up for ourselves, and we are in danger of eternal damnation. That is the self. That is where sin came from. That is where Satan came from. He was created a beautiful angel, but when he said, I'm going to lift my throne up, Above the most high God. I will. I will. He's the God of self. And if he can get you on the throne where you're deciding how you're going to live and who you're going to talk to and what you're going to talk about, he's got you. You're in dangerous territory. But when you say, God, it doesn't matter what I think. What do you think? Let me get in this word. God, speak to me today. God, show me how I can live. Show me what I can hang on to today. Show me a word for me and for others. Then you're putting yourself into the territory where God can come in to your life and be, you will be known by him because when you just say, God, I don't know what to do, but I'm counting on you and you just fall back. You know that game where you fall back? He's going to he's gonna catch, catch you. And that's when you're going to know he's real. See, the rest is the playing a game. Coming and singing and, and going to church on one day a week and thinking that's going to do it. That's a game if you never get to the point where you can just let go and trust him with your life. He brings you to the edge of the cliff and he says, now step off. He comes in walking through the storm and he steps, he says, step out, you know, and then the storm don't stop. Peter's walking on the, on the water and he looks around and sees the storm. He takes his eyes off Jesus. He goes down. Okay, that's normal. But he had enough sense to cry out, help me. And Jesus pulled him up and then they walk through the storm together. It didn't stop till they got back in the boat. When those Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego were in the fire, he walked with them together. He was in there with them. And they were in no hurry to get out. And when Daniel goes down in the lion's den, the angel of the Lord comes and holds the mouth of the lion. And Daniel is not panicking. He's not praying when he hears the, the law. He's not going, oh God, deliver me. Oh God, save me from those lions. He, it says he was thanking God. He was thankful. He did what he did every day. He got up and he was thankful. You know, I've seen people who are very close to the Lord and that's their mode of operandi. 
they get thankful. You can see the bottom falling out, death sentence pronounced by the doctor, and instead of waking up, oh God, save me, oh God, deliver me, they wake up and they say, thank you that I have a house. Amen. Thank you that my eyes are working. I can see today. Thank you that I got legs. I can walk in that kitchen. And thank you I got food. You know, two-thirds of the world doesn't have enough to eat. They don't have an, a house. They don't have enough clothes. You know, we're so blessed here, we don't understand. But when you're thankful, you open a way for God to come save you. Amen. Psalm 50, last verse. He who offers praise glorifies me. And to him who orders his conversation, the way he lives a right, I will show the salvation of God. I will reveal that salvation. That word is Yeshua. Does that sound like a familiar word? It's the Hebrew name of Jesus. He's going to reveal Jesus to us when we're thankful. And we just put one foot in front of the other and do what's right. Daniel's a great example. Okay, let me just pray over this lesson and I pray we'll get it. Lord, give us the grace to live faithfully for you, God. Help us not to become so self-sufficient, God, that we become proud. Lord, help us not to be blown away with every hurt, abandonment, betrayal. Thank you that you're still on the throne, God, and you'll never abandon your faithful servants. God, you stopped the mouths of lions. You walked through the fire with Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. You walked over the waves through the storm with Peter, God, and you're here with us, a very present help in time of need. God, I pray that as we... Listen today, God, you would open our hearts and minds, Lord. Get rid of those worry uh, weeds of uh, concern about money, concern about the things of this world, God. Break off those hard places in our heart, God. Give us the grace to forgive and to open our hearts to you today. Let us be good soil, broken and ready for the seed. In the word of God, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Daniel is an overcomer. Chapters 2 and chapter 3 in Revelation are all about churches. They relate exactly to us. Not only do they map the church history through history, but they, we all fall into one of those churches. And every one of them ends with, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. To him who overcomes. <laughs> you know, as Christians, that's why we, we don't have luck, because we have authority in Christ to overcome luck. We have authority over faith. We have authority over circumstances. We have authority over the actions of others and over our own passions. They have no power over us unless we let them. And how do you let them? By thinking about them, meditating on them, putting our time and energy into them. That's why in Philippians 4, 6-9, it says, Don't be anxious, worried about anything. But in everything, with prayer and supplication, what? With thanksgiving. There's the key again. Make our requests known to God. And the peace of God that passes all understanding. That means above circumstances, above what anybody did to us, above even what our perception of what God did, will guard that peace, will guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Then it goes on to tell us what to think about. The things that are true and noble and just and pure and praiseworthy and, and virtuous and of a good report. Those are the things you meditate on and it brings the very presence of God into your life and into your home. So that what we invest our thoughts in is what comes into our life. Where does Daniel put his thoughts? Where do we put our thoughts when things start going bad? Do we say, oh, no matter, I'm just going to do what I want to do? Or do we realize that God is really there? This is a test. He's going to know what's really in our heart. And so is everybody around us. They're going to find out what's really in our heart. Okay, it pleased Darius, chapter 6 of Daniel, we're finally there. To set over the kingdom 120 satraps, those are government leaders, to be over the whole kingdom. And over these three governors, of whom Daniel was one, that the satraps might give account to them so that the king would suffer no loss. So here you got it, 120 rulers over areas, provinces in the kingdom, Three guys over them, checking them out to make sure they're being honest so that the king won't suffer any loss. Then this Daniel distinguished himself above the governors and sap traps because an excellent spirit was in him and the king gave thought to setting him over the whole realm. The king was planning on putting Daniel over the three governors, over all the satraps. He'd be over everything. And this made these guys nervous because they're not honest. And that was very common. 
you know, even in Jesus' time, the tax collectors were sanctioned by the Roman government, and they had a certain amount of money they had to turn in for all the people. But whatever they collected above that, they could keep. So the people hated them because these were traitors. You know, they were Jews who were living among them and collecting taxes and charging extra and keeping it. They're becoming rich while the other people were becoming poor. Wasn't one of the disciples even a tax collector? Matthew. Yeah, the book of Matthew was written by Levi was his Hebrew name. And he was a tax collector. And he was hated. One of those disciples was called a zealot. They were zealots. They were people who were so zealous for Israel to be back the kingdom of God again and get rid of the Romans and the zealots hated tax collectors. <laughs> Most people hated tax collectors. But for Jesus to pick guys like that, you know, people that would look just totally dysfunctional in the world and, you know, Cusser, Peter, you know, John, Colin wants to call down fire on everybody, you know. Uh, it's just, it's just amazing because later after he dies, they're standing before the rulers who are telling them, don't ever talk in his name again under threat of death. And they're like, you tell us what we should do. Should we obey you or should we obey God? And they were looking at him and they're saying, well, these are ignorant and uneducated men. But they realized they had been with Jesus. And that's what changed them. That's what changes us. He picks ordinary, dysfunctional men who can't do, make it on their own. All these guys were skipped over. You know, these were the guys who went to be fishermen and tax collectors. And, you know, they weren't the ones who went to Israel, to Jerusalem to go to college, to the seminary and become the leaders. These were the guys who were passed over. That's who Jesus went to. He didn't go to Israel, to the seminary, and say, give me your smartest, your best. I'm starting a kingdom. He took guys like us, and they were transformed by being in his presence. That should give us some hope. <laughs> but anyway... Daniel was a cut above. He was gifted, talented. He was honest. He was a hard worker. He served these pagan kings who took away his life, put him into captivity, maybe even took his masculinity. He served them, and they liked him. We're going to see Darius get mad here in a second. And he's not mad because Daniel doesn't obey the rule. He's mad because he, these guys tricked him into making this rule and he loves Daniel and he spends all night all night praying for Daniel and he spends the whole afternoon trying to figure out how to get Daniel out of trouble but you remember when we saw in, in the dream Nebuchadnezzar had and he had that statue that was up above the world and the head was gold and Daniel said that head represents you Nebuchadnezzar the king of kings he had the greatest empire on the earth and then the next empire was silver and he had two arms. That represents this empire, the Medo-Persian Empire. The Medes and the Persians were the two arms, silver. And he said that empire wasn't as great as the first empire, the one of gold. Well, the, the empire was bigger, had more people, had a more powerful army. Why do you think he would say it's not as great? The Persians had more respect for other gods than the Babylonians did because that's why you see later on the Persians funding the rebuilding of the temple Cyrus, the Persian, funding the, the projects. You know, uh, Hazarus, when Nehemiah goes, he, they fund the rebuilding of the walls and send them. Because they want, they figure, the more gods, the better. You know, we'll have them praying to their God for us too, and that'll make it better. But the real thing that I noticed is Daniel giving um, Nebuchadnezzar's testimony, 518, O king, the Most High God gave Nebuchadnezzar, your father, kingdom and majesty, glory and honor. And because of the majesty that he gave him, all peoples and nations and languages trembled in fear before him, before one guy, whomever he wished, he executed. Whoever he wished, he kept alive. Whoever he wished, he set up. Whoever he wished, he put down. But his heart became lifted up in pride and then God intervened. And Nebuchadnezzar had absolute power. He was the absolute ruler. Now, we're going to see here in the, in the Persian Empire, the, the law was actually above the king. When the king made a law and signed it, the king couldn't even break it. See? So this was a different kind. This is moving more toward law and then the rule of the people will be the next empire, the, the Greeks. And so actually the empires get weaker and weaker until it ends up with the last empire, which is a combination of, of iron and clay. And that's the one that's shattered. Of course, clay is weak. When you mix something with iron and clay, it's not nearly as strong as a pure metal. And the, the rock, not cut with human hands, smashes it. 
the whole, the whole statue becomes shaft, blown away with the wind, and that rock, of course, is Christ, becomes a great mountain empire and rules the whole earth. But this empire is not as strong as the first one because law is over the king. He had the strongest empire. He was in absolute control. Um, you know, in the next king, when we see that Daniel is faithful all the way through Darius' reign and through Cyrus' reign, the Persian. So Cyrus is mentioned in the Bible, hundreds of years before he's born, prophecy about him funding the rebuilding of Jerusalem, the temple, and the gods interacting in their lives. I believe the reason why it was considered a less powerful empire was because there was not absolute control from the, the ruler, the, the leader. And we're going to see this. He wants to, he wants to take Daniel out of the lion's den, and he can't. After this, though, after the historical record that we see of the empires, and after this, we start moving into the more prophetic books, and you see him praying, and you see God interacting with him, telling him basically what's going to happen in the rest of the future of, of the world. From then on, and even still future from now. But Daniel was very close to the Lord. He did know what was happening. He had total trust in God. And historically, some of those priests that were involved with Daniel did let the other guys in. They let them come in. <laughs> they, did, they weren't against the Persian Empire. Of course, the Persians were what I said. They embraced all different religions. They thought the, better, the more the better. And, and we realize that at the end of the story, only one stands. And that's the kingdom of God through Christ Jesus. In verse 4, the governor's satraps found, sought to find some charge against Daniel concerning the kingdom, but they could find no charge or fault because he was faithful. Nor was there any error or fault found in him. And another way to look at that word faithful is full of faith. Faithful. He was full of faith. And that caused him to do what was right. So these governors and satraps thronged before the king and said thus to him, O King Darius, live forever. All the governors of the kingdom, the administrators, the satraps, the counselors, the advisors, have consulted together to establish a royal statute and to make a firm decree that whoever petitions or prays to any god or man for 30 days except you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. Right away, you see them lying. They said all the governors of the kingdom, right? And up in verse 2, you see Daniel is one of the governors. Daniel is not a part of this. They're lying to the king. They're either appealing to his pride or to some problem in the empire. And they're saying they've all talked about it. And this is what they thought was best to do. 30 days, 30 in the ancient Jews, Jewish uh, tradition does have to do with death. And so they're saying, you know, for 30 days. And they're wanting the death of Daniel. Who actually ends up getting killed? Does anybody remember? Them. Yeah, they, Them. They throw, they, when Daniel comes out, the king wants them to throw all the... The accusers, the, and, and the lions tear them up before they even hit the floor. Before they even hit the floor. Yeah, yeah. So those lions were hungry. Yeah. <laughs> they were starving them, and they were hoping this is what happened to Daniel. But okay, so now King established the decree, verse 8, and signed the writing, so that it cannot be changed according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which does not alter. I think the reason they made that law is because they're saying this king, he's wise, and he, he's going to make the right decision, and we're not going to change it once he signs it into law. But anytime anybody says they know the absolute answer, be careful, because <laughs> we're all fallible, and we should all be aware of anybody who says, I have the absolute answer, and this is the only way. You should be aware of that. But that's what they kind of did here. They're saying whatever the king says, that goes, and nobody can change it. The ironic thing is, not even the king can change it. <laughs> if he admits he's wrong, right? Okay, therefore, King Darius signed the written decree. And now, Daniel, when he knew that the writing was signed, went home in his upper room with his window open toward Jerusalem, knelt down on his knees three times that day, and said, oh God, help me. No, he prayed and gave thanks. <laughs> he did what he always did. This did. He didn't miss a lick. This didn't scare him. He served the Most High God. That's the example that we have here. That we can't let these things bother us. We can't think about what other people did. We can't think what we think God abandoned us or the circumstances coming up and oh no, I did everything right and now this is happening. They don't have nothing to do with it. What has something to do with it? how we respond. It's 10% what happens to us, 90% how we respond. And this is what he did. He didn't change anything. He didn't even think about it. He just went home, prayed, and started thanking God. Thank you, God. 
Thank you, God, you're setting us free. Thank you. I'm praying toward Jerusalem. I'm praying your prayers. You're going to set us free. You're going to bring us out of captivity. You're going to restore our lives. Thank you, God, with thanks before his God, as was his custom since the early days. So he just did what he would do every day. And these men assembled and found Daniel praying and making supplication before his God. And they went before the king and spoke concerning the king's decree. Have you not signed a decree that every man who petitions any God or man within 30 days except you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions? The king answered and said, The thing is true, according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which does not alter. So they answered and said before the king, That Daniel the one of the captives from Judah does not show due regard to you, O king, or for the decree that you have signed, but makes his petitions three times a day. And the king, when he heard these words, was greatly displeased with himself, with himself for being tricked by these guys. He was greatly displeased with himself. And he set his heart to deliver Daniel. So he's trying to figure out how he can get Daniel out of this. And he labored or he strove until the going down of the sun. And that's interesting because, you know, like the Hebrew days start at sundown. You know, it doesn't start in the morning. Sundown is when it starts. They took Jesus off the cross because they were having a holy day, Passover, and it started at sundown. They needed him off the cross by sundown. You know, when it says honor the Sabbath, the Sabbath started at Friday at sundown, and it was all day Saturday until sundown. Still is in Israel, still around the world. Right. Starts at sundown, and that, and so evidently the Babylonians did this too. And he had to get them freed from the lion den before sundown, or else he had to put them in. So he worked until sundown to deliver him. Then these men approached to the king, and he said, "King, king, no, O king, that it is the law of the Medes and Persians that no decree or statute with the king establishes may be changed." So the king gave the command, and they brought Daniel and cast him into the den of lions. But the king spoke, saying to Daniel, Your God, whom you serve continually, he will deliver you. Then a stone was brought and laid on the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet ring and with the signets of the lords, uh, that the purpose concerning Daniel might not be changed. And so in other words, when they come back in the morning, those that wax seal was stamped with there and it's unbroken. That means that nobody got in there and helped rescue Daniel, that it was untouched. Now the king went to his palace and spent the night fasting. King Darius fasted and prayed for Daniel all night. And no musicians were brought before him and also his sleep went from him. He didn't have his normal entertainment and he couldn't sleep. And the king rose very early in the morning and went in haste to the den of lions. And when he came to the den, he cried out with a lamenting voice to Daniel. The king spoke, saying to Daniel, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to deliver you from the lions? He's yelling and he can't see him across his stone. And Daniel said to the king, O king, live forever. You know, those other guys said, O king, live forever. They don't really care if he does or not. They just want to make money, right, and have their power. But Daniel really means it. Daniel loves this guy, and he loves Daniel. O king, live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouth so that they had, if they have not hurt me, because I was found innocent before him, before God. And also, O king, I have done no wrong before you. Now the king was exceedingly glad for him and commanded that they open the lion's den and Daniel was taken out of the den and no injury whatever was found on him because he believed in his God. And the king gave them command and they brought those men who had accused Daniel and cast them into the den of lions. Not just them. When we make a decision to go against God, this affects everybody around us. But they cast them, their children, and their wives, and the lions overpowered them and broke all their bones in pieces before they even came to the bottom of the den. Then King Darius wrote, and here we go, this is the, the Persian king now, kind of doing what Nebuchadnezzar did here, Sam. Mm -hmm. To all peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, Peace be multiplied to you. I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom, men must tremble and fear before the God of Daniel. 
For he is the living God, the steadfast forever. His kingdom is the one which shall not be destroyed, and his dominion shall endure to the end. He delivers and rescues, and he works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth, who has delivered Daniel from the power of the lions. So this Daniel prospered in the reign of Darius and in the reign of Cyrus, the Persian. Praise the Lord. What an example Daniel is for us, isn't he? He was totally unaffected. You know, like what they say, you know, do this or you're going to die. And it's something that we really feel like we don't, you know, stop worshiping God. Don't go to church or you're going to die. Renounce Christ or you're going to die. I hope we'll all be able to take a stand. But he didn't even worry about it. He was like, you know, Paul was like, you know, for me to die is gain. Okay. Well, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this example of Daniel. God, how he stood firm even when everything looked bad. When Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego were thrown in the fire, they walked around with you. They had a party because they were willing to die for what they believed in. God, give us that kind of strength. God, help us to be like Daniel. Help us to take a stand for what's right and what your word, Father God. Help us to just shed off these cares and concerns of the world that make us think that we're so important for what we do and what we have and what we want to do. And God, cast our cares onto you. God, we want to see you intervene in these situations of our life. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.